So, most users of computers will probably have some experience with this. You know when you're online shopping, and sometimes a box pop-ups, and says click this, promo code, sign up yada yada? Well, we know they are scams. My mistake, I first clicked the wrong x they put a fake one on the top and I clicked it. I immediately shut the page and thought, that was the end of it. Nope. So, the site I bought the Hanuka gift I was getting for my mother sold my credit card information to the pop-up. I activated that, when I clicked the wrong x I was a teenager, relatively new to my checking account. I checked my statement for December and all was well. I didn't check for the next couple months, because I didn't use it for anything, there should be no charges, I know better now. When I did check, I noticed all these small insignificant charges that weren't mine. Always less than $10, and usually around $2. But the multiple charges added up to just over $200. When I looked into this, I found the connection. I called the thieving company and told them they stole my information and are illegal charging my card. They didn't deny it, but they also didn't care. I wanted my money back, they refused repeatedly. I gave them so many chances to fix everything with just that. I eventually warned them I would have to sue if they didn't give back what they stole. They laughed. Turns out there was a class action suit in progress, which my lawyer used as leverage for a quick payout. We sued for fraud and violation of federal communication laws. What they are doing is very illegal, and happens every day. This included a lot of popular stores and websites. Since they were 100% in the wrong, and committed a crime, and I was a child who bought her mother a gift, I won the case. I received a judgment of $21,000. I told them it would all go away by just refunding my $200, but they refused. They seemed to think a teenager threatening to sue a massive corporation that does nothing but break the law wasn't much of a threat. What they should have noticed, I was buying a Hanuka gift. Hanuka. Everyone I know is a lawyer. My friend and I rode our bikes into town. There were only a few designated areas for bikes. A car was parked in the middle of the clearly marked bike bay. Only two spaces available, one at the front one at the back. We put our bikes in those two spaces. On the way to the shop we spotted a traffic warden. Told her about the car. She put a ticket on it. Ten minutes later, we return to our bikes the driver is waiting by her car. She starts yelling at us about how petty we were for blocking her in. We ignore her. I say to my friend I'm thirsty. I need a coffee. As we're talking, she's still ranting. Traffic warden hash 2 writes her a ticket. We go off for a coffee. 20 minutes later, again we return to our bikes. By now she is red in the face angry. She starts screaming in our faces about how she could just run over our bikes. My friend is only 5 ft5. In started talking to her calmly that would be a mistake. If anything happens to our bikes we would know it was you. You've already got two tickets she cut him off. She rang the police claiming that two big bikers were threatening her, her alone female. The police arrived within minutes, and in numbers, they separated us, heard our version of events, the truth, the police believed us, one of the police officers spoke to us but loud enough for her to hear you lads have had some stress, I don't want either of you riding your bikes, go for a walk, grab a coffee meanwhile another police officer is giving her a ticket. 40 minutes later, we returned to our bikes just in time to see traffic warden hash 2 issuing another ticket. No idea where she was. Only went to town to buy some paint. Meant to be only 5 minutes. She ended up with 4 fixed penalty tickets. Here's another little tale from my days working in the entertainment business. Very early on in my career, I managed to get a gig working as a showman. A person hired in just to work the show, on stage electrics, and follow spots on a major West End musical. Even though I was nominally a sound engineer, the chance to work on a big show in albeit a different capacity was too good to pass up. When you're a youngster in this industry, you would be daft to turn down such an opportunity, because the experience garnered is invaluable, even if it's not directly related to your primary skill set. We spent around 6 weeks working on the production fit up. Most of the time I was working on rigging lamps, running cables, installing additional dimmer racks yada, yada. Sometimes, I got to help out the sound crew rigging their kit, and thus got to know them quite well. Fast forward to a few months after opening night, some of the electrics showmen 
myself included, had managed to pick up the occasional extra work assisting the daemon crew who were permanently hired to the theater, doing lamp rounds. This is where you go round the entire theater, front and backstage, replacing burnt out lamps useful extra money. Thus I happened to be in the theater well before the half hour call, and was hanging out with the sound crew at the sound desk. There were two of them we'll call them Pete and Chris. One would run the foreboard for that night's show, while the other would do other jobs like handing out the radio mix to the cast at the half, collect them at the end, and troubleshoot any problems during the show. Feed also swapped duties every day. So, we hear the half called, and Chris goes off backstage with his box of radio mix to hand them out, while I carry on chatting to Pete. About 10 minutes later, we see Chris returning to the fod desk looking very distressed. Pete asked him what on earth was wrong. It transpired that the male juvenile lead had bar locked out Chris for some utterly trivial problem to the point where he had been reduced to tears. I should point out that this particular actor was not well liked by the crew because of his arrogant and holier than thou attitude. This did seriously not sit well with Pete at all. By this time, the audience was beginning to fill the auditorium and you could hear the ambient chatter level going up. Pete then grabbed his headphones and parking one earpiece over his right ear, proceeded to punch in the pre-fade listen button for that actor's channel. A grin then crept over his face. He then brought the channel lift and very slowly raised the channel fader. He handed Chris the cans and a huge grin also spread across his face. Chris then handed me the cans so I could hear what had amused him so much. I listened in to be confronted by the sound of the actor right in the middle of taking a full throttle dump while talking grunts and groans, and levels of flatulence quite the equal of the trumpets that flattened the walls of Jericho. Bear in mind that this sound is now being leaked out into the auditorium, albeit at a level just barely perceptible to the audience. I glanced around at the punters in the stalls and saw that quite a few people were looking around quizzically. I had to struggle to rein in my laughter at the delicious payback, but as it was getting close to act 1 beginners, I had to go off and take my station, so I high-fived my friends and went through the stage pass door to the electrics crew room to be confronted by my colleagues falling about in hysterics. It was then that I became aware of a peculiarity with the show relay. For context, the show relay is a microphone front of house and a bunch of speakers all over the backstage and dressing room areas that allow cast and crew to listen into the progress of a show. Due to a curiosity of its design, what was just barely audible out front was now being hugely magnified backstage. The entire cast and crew, no matter where they were, were being subjected to the sounds of our actor dropping the kids off at the pool at practically full volume. For the rest of the show, the hapless idiot had to contend with the entire cast and crew giggling uncontrollably whenever he went past and all the while remained completely oblivious to the reason why, as the one place there were no show relay speakers was in the toilets. Back in the early 90s, I got a gig working as a front of house sound engineer on a major 10 day music and arts festival in London's Docklands with some 15 stages dotted all around the waterfront. All of the crew working the stages were either experienced theatre techs and or had loads of experience working major outside events, which is the reason we were hired. As an aside, this festival was to celebrate the culmination of massive investment in the redevelopment of this area of East London, itself the former site of one of the largest dock complexes in the world. I was tasked with running for sound on one of the largest stages. Normally, events like this are loads of fun to work, but within two days it became apparent that the organizers had one, no idea of how to run major outside events and two, had not the faintest idea of how to book acts and schedule same. In particular, we also had to contend with some woman from Docklands middle management team who had been given the job of overseeing our particular stage, a person who not only had rapidly proved to be totally ignorant of any aspect of managing outside events, but also someone for whom the word entitled had been invented. Our stage was licensed to run events from midday until 10pm, but we rarely had a full day's worth of events for punters to enjoy, due to the aforementioned incompetence with booking. Still, not our problem we'll just work with what's given us. On the Thursday, we had scheduled an evening of old time Victorian music hall which featured, as a special guest, a very famous film and TV actress. Her performance rider required a grand piano. 
for some unfathomable reason, and again due to the incompetence of the organizers, the piano a full-size Yamaha concert grand arrived from the hire company on the Tuesday. This was a remarkably stupid idea for any number of reasons. Due to operational considerations, we had to store the piano in the backstage area, where it spent two days suffering in the heat of the day despite our best efforts to shield it. As any piano technician slash tuner will tell you, this is an extremely bad idea, especially with an instrument worth close to 100,000. Almost as bad was the fact that our area was little more than a roughly graded building site, the ground was covered in hardcore rubble fragments around the size of hen's eggs, very uncomfortable to walk around on, even with proper work boots, which also kicked up loads of dust and other detritus not the sort of crap you want floating about coming up the works of a very expensive concert grand. Now let me properly set the scene. It's midsummer, very hot, and our venue is a large circus style tent with around 800 seat capacity. The cast of the show, along with our August star, were due to turn up at around 1pm to conduct a production rehearsal so we could sort out sound and lighting cues for the show. The main cast duly turn up on time, and we start sorting out their technical requirements, pretty simple and nothing, that we're not used to. At about 1.30pm, our star turns up sporting dark glasses and an immaculate couture. As anyone who's worked in this industry knows, the initial interaction with a major A-list star versus their technical requirements can go one of two ways, full Monty Diva, or let's go with what we have. Her first demand was that the piano be dropped off the front of the stage, so that she could maintain an eye line whilst standing right down stage, both with her pianist and with the audience. The stage was about 4.5 feet above ground level, and would have required at least 8 burly lads to safely shift a full-size concert grand off the deck. Also not a good idea, since it had been tuned that morning, and moving it would have almost certainly caused the tuning to go out of whack. I delicately pointed out that doing so would be in direct violation of both health and safety, and fire regulations us per our written policias it would have put the piano in both the fire lane and close to one of the primary emergency exits from the venue. Thinking rapidly, I then suggested that we place the piano as far down stage as physically possible, and that she page herself 3 or 4 feet up stage, so that she could still glance over and take cues from her MD whilst still taking in the audience. The tension was palpable, after a few seconds consideration she replied, no problem, I can work with that. Phew. No sooner than this crisis had been averted than the Docklands rep rocked up. I remind you, gentle reader, that this person had absolutely zero knowledge about how to run an outside event. She had also been a major thorn in our side for the previous week, trying to micromanage proceedings in the venue, in order to big herself up in front of her bosses, we, of course, completely ignored her suggestions, but in such a way as made her think she was in charge of trust me, she wasn't. She had also been inexcusably rude to virtually every single member of the crew from day one, and had over the days previous reduced several of them to tears. Production crews don't take kindly to our own being, treated in such a cavalier fashion, and while we're generally fairly thick-skinned, there comes point where we want to get our own back. Believe me, after a week of constant abuse, we were coming up with creative ways of disposing of the body. Although we didn't realize it at the time, our savior was at hand but I digress. Obviously starstruck. She announced in gushing tones that she would be taking personal charge of our star's every need and that we were not to concern ourselves with that aspect, indeed, we were to keep our place as we were only the hired help. Our stage manager, who was at that time sweeping the stage, bridled at the suggestion and made as if to use his broom to beat the brains out of this woman. I had to step in front of him as unobtrusively as possible and stop him from burying the woman right there and then she ain't worth it, mate. She then swanned off, leaving our star slack jawed in amazement. She then turned to me and said, is that effing woman for real? I replied, darling, you have no idea, at which point she laughed uproariously. I gave our star a brief summary of the previous few days for our go and instantly, she became one of us, and from then on we were all on first name terms. We then ran a full tech rehearsal from 3pm to 5pm, sorted out all our cues, and then repaired to the beer tent with the cast for a spot of late lunch and a drink or two. The show was scheduled to kick off at 7.30pm. At around 6pm, the Harridan reappeared to overlook the situation. 
she noticed that we had all the sides of the tent raised in order to get some air flowing through i remember it's midsummer and it's currently low to mid 80s she then demanded that all of the tent flaps be lowered because she wanted a more theater atmosphere and the light spilling through the side walls would spoil the effect Despite pointing out that dropping the tent sides would significantly raise the temperature in the venue, she demanded the sides be dropped, so despite our earnest advice to the contrary, we reluctantly complied. At around 7pm, we saw 850 seat coaches arrive. To our amazement, out from the coaches came an entire flotilla of old age pensioners, many on Zimmer frames, who proceeded to shuffle their way into the tent across the hardcore rubble underfoot. We discovered later that the organizers had forgotten to advertise the event anywhere, seriously, and in desperate on, had gone around to all the local Derby and Joan clubs a couple of days before handing out free tickets and laying on transport in order to have an audience. So now we have 400 odd OAPs frantically fanning themselves with anything to hand as the temperature climbs ever higher. We start the show, everything's going fine, but the mercury in the thermometer I have strapped to the forack is slowly going up and up, it's so hot up at the sound desk that I'm down to my shorts. By the end of act 1, the temperature has gotten up to around 94 F and one could clearly see the old dears are in a bit of distress. Naturally, the organizers had neglected to provide water for the public, and judging by the horrified expressions of the to St. John's ambulance first aiders stationed either side of the stage, things were about to get a lot worse. I climbed off the tower, found the rigging crew, and ordered the sides of the tent raised. No sooner had I done so than our friend standing nearby demanded that the side stay down, because she was in charge and her instructions were to be followed absolutely, no questions. It was at this juncture that diplomacy went completely out of the window. I informed her in no uncertain terms, and employing a fair amount of Anglo-Saxon vernacular, that it was in fact the crew who had the responsibility of ensuring the health and safety of all the people in the venue, not her, and that we have the legal authority to enact any procedure that we see fit at any time to ensure the safety and well-being of everyone present. I then informed her that I was now exercising my authority under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 to remediate the situation, and that if she made one single attempt to circumvent that authority, I would have her ejected from the venue without hesitation. She then got in my face and screamed, I'm in charge. No strike one, no strike two, instant strike three. I glanced over at two of our security crew who had been hovering in the background with huge crap eating grins on their faces, who then stepped up by the side of her. Defeated, but complaining like a banshee with a terminal case of hemorrhoids, she was escorted off the premises in short order. By the time Act 2 kicked off, we'd gotten the temperature down to a more manageable low 70F, much to the appreciation of our audience, and the rest of the show went off without a hitch. After the show cast and crew including our august stare repaired to the bar for a well-earned drink. Moments later, you know who appeared and in imperious tones informed us that our star was to be the guest of honor at a VIP reception for the various Docklands bigwigs. With a tinge of regret for having our fun curtailed prematurely, we said our goodbyes to our star. Now it gets interesting. Not 10 minutes later, she storms back into the beer tent with a face like absolute thunder. Taken somewhat aback by her reappearance, we inquired as to why she had returned. That effing woman. She drags me off to this so-called VIP party. I get there, and all that's there are two effing plates of curled up ham sandwiches and two effing boxes of cheap wine from Sainsbury's. How the holy f did she get this job? I gave her a right bloody earful and came back here because I'd much rather drink with you guys. At which point she calls the barman over and orders around for the entire crew. We spend the rest of the evening chatting away like old friends. She regaled us with stories of her life and she was gracious enough to listen to some of ours. Despite us trying to buy her a drink, she refused point blank and picked up the entire bar tab for the rest of the evening on the basis that she have had to put up with that effing evil beach all week, the least I can do get you folks a drink. All good things must come to an end, and at the end of the evening, her chauffeur turns up to take her home. She embraces all of us as old friends, she hugs me, plants a big kiss on my lips and thanks me, whereupon I comment, you have just fulfilled a boyhood dream. Again, that uproarious laugh. She looks at me and says, don't let that effing beach get you down. 
Leave it to me. I later discovered through the back channel some weeks later that RBT Noir had been fired from her five figure job for her monstrous screw up, primarily because our star's agent had ripped the organizers a new one in very short order. You do not F with someone of our star's track record without there being consequences. So, although we were not directly responsible for the Harridan's demise, we were gratified to have someone of our star's caliber standing up for us. Revenge is a dish best served cold. If you enjoyed the stories, slap the like and subscribe button for more of them, and don't forget to support the original writers with an upvote, links are in the description. Peace out, and catch you tomorrow.